Okay, here we are at polynomial inequality. What you're going to see is the math code, but I, in my wonderfulness, have translated it for you over here. So over here we see the code. x squared minus 17x plus 66 is strictly greater than zero. But what this is really saying is where on the x-axis is f of x totally above the x-axis? Because if we let f of x be x squared minus 17x plus 66, which is right here, the zero is equal zero, which is the x-axis. And a, a greater than in this context means above. So we're looking for where is the graph above, not even on, but above the x-axis. And here's where that is. And if you've graphed it, see, I put this graph on there. You can see where that happens. We're going to have an open circle here. And then this part of the graph is above the x-axis and it goes on forever and an open circle here, and then this part of the graph goes on forever, and it's above the x-axis. So this tilts out to the left all the way to negative infinity, and this tilts out to the right all the way to positive infinity. And so this part of the x-axis is where the graph is above the x-axis, and this part of the x-axis is above the x-axis, is the part of the x-axis where the graph is above the x-axis. So our answer is going to look like this, negative infinity into the first zero right here, call it zero one, and then from second zero, the second zero, or x-intercept, call it that, to infinity, all we have to do is find for sure what Z1 and Z2 are, and we'll be able to answer the questions. The problem with graphs like this is while it looks like one, two, three, four, five, six, it looks like that point is six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. You can't totally completely believe that 6 and 11 are the zeros. So you're gambling. You could answer negative infinity to 6, unioned up with 11 to infinity, and that's where on the x-axis the graph is above the x-axis. But then what if it's wrong? So we're going to go through all the steps. So first we're going to find the x-intercepts, which are, you know, you're finding the zeros, and then if they're real numbers, they will be the x-intercepts. So here we go. I take x squared minus 17x plus 66, and I set it equal to zero. That mean, that's the part that's actually on the x-axis, the x-intercepts. Okay, except we're just going to be finding what x equals, so those are the zeros. Uh, this is factorable, 66 equals six times 11, and negative six, 
11. Oh, and look at this, negative 6 plus negative 11 is negative 17, which is the number we're looking for right there. So that means we have our two numbers, parentheses, x minus 6, parentheses, closed, parentheses, open, x minus 11, equals 0. Then we set our factors equal to 0 and solve for x. x minus 6 equals 0, so x equals 6, positive 6. And x minus 11 equals 0, so x equals 11. Well, that's great. Those points really are 6 and 11. So if you've graphed this, or now let's say you haven't graphed it, but you know that a quadratic trinomial or a quadratic anything with a positive leading term is going to give you a cupped up parabola. So that you've just found out this is 6 and this is 11. And just by looking at your crummy little graph, my crummy little graph, um, you can tell that this is the part above the x-axis and this is the part above the x-axis. So you could actually answer from here. But the book teaches a certain number of steps, so let's just do it. After you know what the x-intercepts are, you can plot them on, you can just draw your own little x-axis. And then plot the two points anywhere, provided the one that's on the left is really on the left, and the one that's on the right is really on the right. And then you can see immediately that there are three intervals you get from those two zeros. Negative infinity to six, six to 11, and 11 to positive infinity. Okay, so that would be from here to here, over to the left of the parabola, or I should say really over to the left of the x-intercepts, between the two x-intercepts, and over to the right of the x-intercept, of, of the far right x-intercept. So now somewhere in here, we need to find a test point, not at the ends, but just somewhere inside, somewhere inside this interval. And I could make it anything. How about zero? Because zero is really, really easy. So I'm going to let zero be my test point in here. And then between 6 and 11, I can choose a number I like. Um, I could choose 8. I could choose 10. I could choose 7. 10 is easy. Let's choose 10. It's right here. It's inside the interval. So I'll write a 10. And then um, over here, way over here, it can be anything. I could make it positive a million, billion, trillion, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do something easy, like how about 12? You don't have to choose the same numbers I choose. Not 10. What am I doing? 12. Okay, and here we've got zero. Now these are my test points. I'm going to let zero be T, P, one. 
test point one, and I'm going to let 10 be TP2. And I'm going to let 12 be TP3. Those are my test points right here. Oops. There now. Okay, time for a drink. Now I want you to notice for me that nothing in here is hard or any already know how to do. And in fact, this problem has lots of handy dandy shortcuts, depending on how much you already know. Um, so now step three, step two was to make the table and to fill in, I should say, and fill in the intervals and the test points. But step three now, we're going to calculate the signs, and this is what I mean by signs, you'll see. Um, we're going to find f of x, okay, and we're going to evaluate it for the three test points. 0, 10, and 12. So let me erase my TP1, TP2, and TP3. And I'll put the numbers in instead, 0, 10, 12. Okay, 0, 10, and 12. And all this is is math code, okay? It's math code for put a zero in for every X, put a 10 in for every X, put a 12 in for every X, to which I say, okay. Okay, now these are zeros. So they're just going to be zero. Plus 66 will be 66, but I'm going to include the sign. It's positive. That's the sign I'm going to put here. When I put a zero in for every X, I got a number, calculated a number that was positive. Okay, now 10. I'll have 10 squared minus 17 times 10 plus 66. And I will use my calculator for that. So what are we going to do here? 10. 10 squared minus 17 times 10 plus 66. I get negative four. With an emphasis on the negative, that's the sign of the number, S-I-G-N, the sign of the number. So I'll put a minus there, a minus sign, negative sign. Then I'll do the same with 12. I'll put a 12 in for every number, for every X rather. Now let's do this. Okay, we're going to have 12 squared minus 17 times 12 plus 66. Enter. 6, I get 6. Positive. It's not negative, so it's positive. Positive 6. 
That's a positive. I am done with my chart. I wasn't sure how much room this would take. So I put step four way down here. And what this means is we now are going to solve x squared minus 17x plus 66 is greater than zero by looking at the meaning just of greater than zero. Because greater than zero in the math language is just another way of saying positive. Means positive. So this, this interval will be greater than zero, and this interval will be greater than zero. So these are the solutions These are the solutions to this polynomial inequality. So let me go back to black there. All right, solve the following inequality. Well, I mean, we already knew this just from looking at the picture, but the solution, what you would put in the answer box would be, in fact, let's make a little answer box. We'll make an answer box down here. Okay, I, I don't know how long, how much room this will take. So, um, 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 negative infinity to six, but not including six because this said strictly above zero, strictly greater than zero. Um, unioned up with 11 to positive infinity. And so, of course, in my math lab, I mean, the answer box just gets bigger with your answer. So you don't have to worry about it. But there we go. That is the solution, which again, you already knew. This is a very basic problem. It's factorable. If you doubted your graph, and I do always doubt it because I have been outsmarted by very nasty teachers, and if, if I would answer six and be sure I was right, then they would say I was wrong because if I had done enough work to find out, then I would find out that the answer was 5.993285. Really? Yes, it has happened to me. Honest. It has happened. So I no longer trust graphs completely. Especially not if I have a test grade on, uh, weighing on it. Okay, so that these are the official steps to solving a polynomial, because a quadratic trinomial is a polynomial, solving quadratic inequalities. The first thing you do is change the greater than or less than or whatever it is, the inequality sign changes. So you'll have x squared minus 17 x plus 66 equals zero. And then solve that if, if you can by factoring, factoring is quicker, but you can also always use the, the quadratic formula with a quadratic, with a quadratic function. Um, and the answers you'd get would be six and 11. So that means those are the x-intercepts. Two x-intercepts divide up the x-axis into three um, intervals. OK, the interval on the left of the left X intercept, the interval between the two X intercepts and the intervals to the right of the right X intercept. 
Those are your three intervals. And the x-intercepts are always where your function actually equals zero. So we're going to have a problem in a minute that's like that. Then you, you write down your intervals. You choose test points that are inside the intervals and not the end points. And then you evaluate the function x squared minus 17x plus 66 here. You evaluate it for the test points. And then you see, well, do I get a positive number or a negative number? Well, we got a positive number here, a negative number here, and a positive number here, which, you know, since you know you've got an upright, an upright, a cupped up parabola, if there are x-intercepts at two different points, then it's crossing the x-intercepts. It's crossing, it's got an above and a below. And so if you've got a cupped up parabola, you will always go plus minus plus, which is pretty good. Okay. If you have a cup down parabola and you've got two x intercepts, here they are. You'll go minus plus minus because this part is below and this part is below the x axis, right? Both of these parts. And this part is above the x axis. Now we're going to do a problem that's a little more interesting than this. So you want to get your steps down. Okay, you find the x-intercepts, you make a table, you find your intervals and your test points, and then you test the test points. So it's really not hard. Want me to go on or do you want to discuss this? I think you're the only person in the class today. Let's see if somebody else has come. <gasps> More people are here. All right, if anybody's got a question, we're talking about polynomial inequalities. And the basic ones are pretty darn easy. So far, I don't have any questions, Ms. Barbara, so I'm going on the OK. So am I. I'm just, maybe everybody OK? It looks like everybody is OK. Now we're going to go on to one that's a little harder, a little more difficult. And I want to um, tell you what this really means. Solve x squared minus 6x minus 15 is greater than or equal to x minus 7. Well, just the way it's written, what this says is where on the x-axis is x squared minus 6x minus 15, which is this blue parabola, where is it on or above the straight line y equals x minus 7? And so there's a way that we don't teach here, but they do in uh, most of the high schools if, if, you had, um, if you had algebra 2 in high school. You probably learned how to do this on a graphing calculator. But what we're looking at right here is where, that wonderful word, where, where is the parabola above the straight line or on the straight line? So this time we're actually including this point 
and where the parabola is above the red line. So this is what we're looking for. Kind of ugly, okay. Now, to do this algebraically, because this is an algebra class after all, we have to use the rule that says you have to pull everything over to the left side. In fact, you know, okay, trust me here. We have to pull X minus seven over to the other side and set this equal to zero. And then find the X intercepts that way. Because we need to find them, but we need to redefine this first. So here's how we're going to redefine it. Um, I did it down here, but let me do it up here. I'm going to subtract X from both sides. Well, I should do it in red, shouldn't I? Since we've got X minus seven there, I'll do it in red. At minus X minus X, and that's a minus one X. And then minus seven plus seven. Because X minus X is zero and negative seven plus seven is zero. So we'll have zero plus zero, which is zero. Now I don't have to worry about turning the sign around because I did not multiply or divide by a negative number. That's the only time you need to worry about turning the sign around. So now let's figure out what we've got here. And what we have is x squared minus 6x and then minus another x is going to be minus 7x. And minus 15 plus 7 is going to be minus 8. So now this is what we have. Where is x squared minus 7x minus 8 above or on the y-axis, uh, the x-axis? All right, well, this is a different graph from this. It's just one graph but it's equivalent for giving us the intervals we're looking for. All we've done is translate this whole thing to one parabola and the x-axis. So now rather than saying, okay, how do I find where, where on the x-axis the parabola is above the red line? Now all I have to do is say, well, well, now it's more normal. Where is this parabola above the x-axis? And we can see it. We can see it if we graph it, um, not just above, but on, greater than or equal to. So we have those x-intercepts or zeros. And we have this part of the parabola that goes on up, up and to the right forever. And this part of the parabola that goes up and to the left forever. All right, and now we can see that the part of the graph, because this keeps going up and to the left until it gets out to negative infinity, 
This goes up and to the right until it gets out to positive infinity. So this part of the x-axis and this part of the x-axis are going to be our solutions. All, all we have to do is be absolutely certain of what the x-intercepts or the zeros are. It looks like this is negative 1, and this is positive 8. And that is BC alert, and if I don't turn it off, it's just kind of going to keep ringing. So give me a second here. It wasn't BC alert, but I'm going to try to turn this off anyway. BC alert is one of the uh, um, alerts, warning systems we use at the college because uh, at least the main branch of the college is in Bentonville, which is BC. OK, so uh, anyway, I recommend it. You can get it for anywhere in Northwest Arkansas. Um, yeah, you really can. OK, now, if I want to be absolutely sure of what the x-intercepts are, I'm going to work this out. x squared minus 7x minus 8 equals 0. And I'm either going to put it in the quadratic formula or I'm going to factor. So x squared, well, I, that could be black, you know. Um, Never mind that. Negative 8. Negative 8 equals, well, how about negative 8 times positive 1? Because if I add negative 8 plus 1, I'll get negative 7, and negative 7 is my B number, my middle number, and that's how I choose the uh, numbers I use. So now we know I'm going to use negative 8 and positive 1. And, and then I set the, the uh, factors equal to 0 and solve for x. x minus 8 equals 0. So I add 8 to both sides. That will give me x equals positive 8. And x plus 1 equals 0. I subtract 1 from both sides to get x by itself. So I get x equals negative 1. So indeed, my guess was correct negative 1 and positive 8 are the x-intercepts. Now, I'm going to make my table. I have to find the intervals I'm working with because the x-intercepts have divided up the x-axis into three intervals. There's this interval and this interval and this interval. And what we want to know is where is the graph above and on the x-axis? Well, here it is on, and here it is above. So you might already know what the answers are. However, if you want to be very, very careful, Let's actually write the intervals. Negative infinity to negative one. We're just writing separate intervals here. Negative one to eight. And eight to infinity. That's here, here, and here. 
Now I need a test point because I'm going to be testing the intervals to make absolutely sure that I get the right signs. So, the, so my test point has to be inside the interval. So how about, well, negative five, negative five is out here. And between negative one and eight is my favorite number zero, x equals zero. So x equals negative five, x equals zero, and how about 10? Between eight and infinity, 10 is a good number. You're free to choose your own numbers as long as they are not on the end points. So let's see, over here in this interval, I'll choose a zero, and over in this interval, I'll choose a 10. Now I'm going to take this, x squared minus seven x minus eight, because that's what this was translated into, which just makes it easier. So I'll have f of x makes the whole process easier. Rather than having two functions, now I have one function. It's easier. So f of x equals x squared minus 7x minus 8. And now I will use my test points. Let me roll this down just a little f of negative five, f of zero, and f of 10. Up here, I put negative five in for the x's. Probably you're going to use your calculator. So always, 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 always with negative numbers, use parentheses. Or it's so easy to get the wrong answer. Now this is gonna be zero, zero, negative eight. And this is going to be 10 squared, it's positive, so I don't have to put it in parentheses unless I want to. Seven times 10 minus eight. And then you can pull out your trusty calculator and let it do the work because that's what it's paid for or something like that. That's what you paid for. Camtasia, go away, go away. Doggone it. Why do these things happen to me? I'm a basically nice person who has flaws. Well, I give up. I don't know. Where am I? I'm right here. Here's the calculator. Um, 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 okay, so parentheses. Negative five, parentheses, close, squared, minus seven, parentheses, negative five, parentheses, closed, minus eight. I get positive 52. It's the plus sign I want to put right here. Now I do this, this I can do in my head because this zeroes out and I'm left with negative eight, which is negative. So I put a negative there. And now here we have 10 squared. 10 squared minus seven times 10 minus eight is 22, positive 22. 
I'm more interested in the sign of the number than I am in the number. Because that's what I need. So the first thing I'm going to do is go back here and look at this. Look at this. Actually, not look at that. Look at this. Look at this. What we're looking for is intervals that are greater than zero, and what this means is positive, or equal to zero, which is zero. Right, that's what we're looking for. We want the intervals that are equal to zero or greater than zero. Oh, that's good. So that happens for two of them, doesn't it? I get a plus for this, and I get a plus for this. Now, not only that, Right now, I've got the greater than. But the equal zero is going to come from the negative one and the positive eight. So my solution, my solution to this inequality is going to be negative infinity to negative one bracket unioned up with bracket eight to infinity. And it just so happens that the original problem The X coordinate of that point is negative one. And the X coordinate of this point is positive eight. And the intervals where the graph of the parabola is above the graph of the line, saying it on the X axis, is going to be, well, here. and here. So when we solved this, we got the solution to this. The original question being, where is this quadratic function above or on this linear function? Where is x squared minus 6x minus 15 above the red line or on the red line? Doggone it, we changed the problem a little bit. And we got our answer easily. Discussion. So, so for whenever, whenever we, we have a problem, problem if you put it in your calculator, <clears throat> often you'll see it right away. Okay. Okay. Now, um, um, Myra, you were going to ask something at the same time, I think. Oh, I was just going to say woohoo. Woo oh, woohoo. Woo I love it. Woo woo. All right, now we go on to one that is a little more difficult. Here's the graph. Now, what, um, what was just said? 
OK, is can you see the answer immediately if you graph it? Not always, but here you can. Here's our question. Where is this cubic function f of x? x to the third minus 7x squared plus 14x minus 8. That's what this is. Where is that below the x-axis? The x-axis is named y equals 0 because y is 0 there. And this is f of x. And now this is saying less than, which in this context means below. Well, I can see that this, now not below or on, just below. But I can see that here, the graph is below the x-axis and continuing out to the right forever. And here the graph, is below the x-axis. Should have put a circle there, an open circle. So these are the parts of the graph of f of x that are below the x-axis. Now I have the graph blown up really large. Notice it goes from negative three on the left to positive four on the right and it only goes up to one, two, three, four, five, and negative one, negative two, negative three, negative four, negative five, so that we can look really closely at the x-intercepts, or the zeros of the function, if you prefer. Um, negative one, oh, this is positive one, this is positive two, this is positive three, this is positive four, so just by looking at the graph, I can be completely certain that the solutions are negative infinities out here, negative infinity to one, unioned up with the interval between two and four, because that's where the graph drops below the x-axis again. Unfortunately, it's complicated, but not real complicated. You can do it, and we're going to do this algebraically, and we're going to come up with the same answers. But let's do it algebraically because it could only help cement some stuff that you've already learned. Okay, this is a... Uh -huh. Yes. So... In this graph, there are no holes, correct? No, there aren't. It's just it's just that I, I wanted to make clear that we're not talking about the x-intercepts. If there had been an equal to underneath, then we would also include the x-intercepts. But okay. here, the x-intercepts are not included. So, so therefore, there is a hole? Well, yes. OK, because that's what I'm getting confused on on the final answer, whether to use brackets or not. Aha, uh -huh. OK, if there had been one of these signs, then you would use a bracket. Then you would use a bracket. OK, OK, then, OK. That makes a lot more sense. Thank you. That's great. But we don't have, so I am erasing it. More questions before I go on. Like, are you about to ask, well, why do we have to do it the long way if that's the short way? Not everybody's good at using graphing calculators. That's why. So this is not a quadratic. And I tried factoring it and wasn't able to factor it. Actually, there's a trick. There's a factoring trick, but it's very complicated. And I don't want to throw that at you too. 
So, um, yeah, we're not going to do that. We, what we are going to do is use the P over Q method to come up with possibilities for X intercepts for, for rational zeros. OK, and then we're going to use um, synthetic division. We're going to find out what the zeros are that way. Isn't that fun? I knew you'd think so. So let's find all possible rational zeros. Because this is what people have to do when they have higher order equations that are not easily factorable. And this is a cubic, so I cannot use the quadratic formula. I can only use the quadratic formula with quadratic functions. So we, we are going to be using the rational zeros theorem, and we start with P over Q. Okay, P, P is going to be the set of all numbers that are integer factors of the constant at the end, and we don't care about the sign. So positive, negative, one, positive negative two, positive negative four, and positive negative eight. Because one times eight is eight and two times four is eight. So one, two, four, and eight end up being the factors. The integer factors, they're not fractions. Okay, now Q, same thing, but look at what Look at where Q is going to come from. There's a one in front of the X to the third. So right away we know this is just plus or minus one. Then we're going to take all the P numbers and put them over all the Q numbers, but Q is one. So two over one is two, four over one is four, eight over one is eight and one over one is one. So our P over Q all possible rational zeros are going to be plus or minus, let's do it the right way. Plus or minus one, plus or minus two, plus or minus four, and plus or minus Eight. Now this shows me that if any of these numbers are not in here, then they're, they're real but irrational numbers. So I'm hoping that I have at least one rational number, but of course we really know we have three. So, but we don't know that yet because maybe we didn't we didn't um, we didn't graph the function. So, all right, now my f of x is going to be one x to the third minus seven x squared plus fourteen x minus 18, and I'm looking for the zeros. So I will set up synthetic division. Negative eight, not 18. Okay. Now, put my backwards L here, and I look at these numbers. What these numbers are is one, two, four, eight, and negative one, negative two, negative four, and negative eight. Now, do any of these numbers look like they could be one of the x-intercepts? Zeros, rather. 
positive one? Yes, let's try positive one. OK. Bring down the one. One times one is one. Negative seven plus positive one is negative six. Negative six times positive one is negative six. 14 plus negative six is positive eight. Positive eight times one is positive eight. And negative eight plus eight is zero. That's my remainder. So that means that one is a rational zero. Okay, the quickest way to find the other zeros is to stop and think for a minute. This is one X to the third. After I go through a complete synthetic division, I'm now dealing with one X squared. And then the powers of X go downhill. OK, so I have X squared minus 6X plus 8. And I'm going to say equals 0 because I want to find out what zeros are there. And you know what we're going to find, right? So let's see, 8 equals negative 2 times negative 4 or 2 times 4 or one times eight, but negative two plus negative four equals negative six, which is this number right here. So that means this is easily factorable. And I have X minus two and X minus four. Now the next step in searching for the zeros is to set each factor equal to zero and solve for X. So here I add two to both sides so that negative two plus two zero out I'm left with X on the left and zero plus two. On. Over at X minus four equals zero, I add four to both sides. Because negative four minus four plus four is zero. So I'm left with X all by itself on the left and zero plus is four. So the two zeros I come up with are two and four. Well, that means this is two and this is four. So now I'm going to make my table. See, you really don't have to graph. I'm going to make my table in which I list the intervals. The test points. And the signs. So what I have to do is this. Um, I always found it easier to draw an x-axis. Well, 
We don't usually put that there, but what the heck. Negative infinity is on the left, positive infinity on the right, and then list my zeros, my, my x-intercepts. Um, I have one, two, and four. I'm going to list them in order. How about one, two, and four, and then if I have three x-intercepts, I will have one, two, three, four intervals. So here they are. Negative infinity to one and one to two and two to four and four to infinity. All I'm doing is listing them because then in each one, I'm going to find a test point. Has to be inside and not on the ends. So here for sure, I mean zeros over here in this interval. So zero, I always choose zero if I can. All right, now here, we're going to be stuck with a fraction, aren't we? What about 1.5? I mean, there's no choice. It's going to be 1 point something because I cannot use 1 or 2. Now, between 2 and 4, that's easier. I can pick 3. And 4 to infinity, I have a lot of freedom, so I can pick 5. So this is really the hard one. Let me write it more clear. It's not hard. It's just bothersome. Okay, we have our test points. All that's left for us to do is this. Need that because I do. Well, where'd it go? There, there it is. f of x equals okay so we are going to evaluate f of x for each of these test points Now remember, you could, if you wanted to, use um, synthetic division and whatever, whatever your um, remainder is, that's what the valuation would be. Um, I'm not going to do it, not because I can't, but because one, it could freak out some students. And two, I don't know, I'm just used to doing this. But you could do it. 
OK, obviously I am going to get a negative 8 with a negative right here because these guys are all zero. So we don't even have to put a whole lot of trouble in there. I get a negative. And then 1.5. Yes, yes, I am going to. I am going to write it here just so I kind of have a record of it, but then I'm going to get the answer in my graphing calculator. Okay, clear. So we have X to the third. This is going to be 1.5, close parentheses. I didn't really need to do that. Click three, carrot three, then come down. Minus seven. Parentheses 1.5. I am just so used to using parentheses, even when I don't need to. Plus 14. One point five. Ah, uh, minus eight. Positive point six two five. So I'll put a plus here. Now we're going to have three to the third minus seven times three squared plus 14 times three minus eight. Three carat three and come down. Minus seven times three squared. I use the X squared button. Plus fourteen times three minus eight. Negative two. Hello there. This is my other cat who almost never comes to visit. There she is. Okay, negative. And then five. So we're gonna do the same thing here. We're gonna have five to the third minus seven times five squared, hello, plus 14, no, plus 14 times five minus eight. So we're gonna have here, five carat three minus times five squared. Ah, you see what happens if you don't take the extra step to come down. Look what happened. And I was being harassed by my cat. How's that for a good excuse? All right, delete, 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 delete. Delete, right arrow key, delete. Oh, heck with it, clear. 
How annoying. Five carat three. Down. Minus seven. Times five squared. Plus fourteen. Times three. Minus eight. No. Okay, okay. Times five, minus eight. See the trouble you're causing? 12, positive 12. <sighs> okay, now, what that means on our graph. Negative means below, plus means above. Negative means below, plus means above. We are looking for the less than, which is the belows, or literally, we are looking for less than zero, which is negative. This, a negative number is less than zero, and a negative number is less than zero, which makes these guys right here our solutions to the inequality. So the solution we already have. Now one more, we have time for one more. I just have to do that. And that's because this one will freak you out. I think it's the last one in the homework. Of course, what you're going to do is this. Oh. That's what happens when you hurry. Plus 18 is less than zero. So we're looking for where this is below the X axis. And when you fiddle around with positive 18, positive 18 is one times 18 and two times nine and three times six, and then the negative version of those two. Negative one times negative 18, negative two times negative nine, negative three times negative six, and none of these add up to negative six, which means we have to use the quadratic formula. Now, what you're going to find when you get to the quadratic formula is X equals um, complex conjugate numbers, okay? They're not real, they're complex. That means there are no x-intercepts. So that means that the graph of x squared minus 6x plus 18 is a cupped up parabola. It's not going to cross the x-axis anywhere or it wouldn't have complex conjugate numbers. So,
get rid of that x axis. Yet, yet these these sides are going to go up forever and ever. So you know you're not going to have any x-axis up there anywhere. Ends up the x-axis is down there. This is entirely above the x-axis. Nowhere is it below the x-axis. And therefore, there is no solution. However, if you graph it, let's graph it real fast. No, not with that, with this. Now what is it we've got? X, X squared minus 6X plus 18. Yeah. And it goes up from there. So there's no way you're going to get it down there. I mean, it's not down there, it's up here. So um, there could not be a solution. So that's the answer to this problem is no solution. One of them, one of them toward the uh, one of the problems toward the end of your homework is a no solution problem for these reasons. And if you go ahead and graph it, you'll see immediately that there is no part. Below the X axis. So you don't have to waste time, you can just say no solution, which is why it's always a good idea that if you can graph, you should graph these and look at them first. 